Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Power Is Now Homeownership Series. My name is Eric Frazier. It's a beautiful day in Southern California, a great day to talk about home ownership. And that's what we've been doing all month long, folks. I have had such a wonderful time uh, meeting extraordinary individuals who are leaders in real estate, uh, real estate agents who are practicing real estate, first time home buyers who have acquired real estate. And it's a big deal. It is truly a big deal to buy a home, to achieve the American dream. It's been extremely rewarding for me to hear their story. We are celebrating Homeownership Month in the month of June. Now, this started in 1995 with Bill Clinton. It was a week-long celebration. Then uh, it became a month-long celebration under George Bush in 2002. And so we are acknowledging those who participate in making the dream possible and those who have achieved the dream. And so I hope you have enjoyed the conversations we've had so far. Please go to our website at thepowerisnow.com and watch the other interviews of individuals who are willing to share their story, their journey to home ownership. Now, June is also Juneteenth. And Juneteenth, that's June 19th, is a day that General Granger arrived in Galveston, Texas to let about 4 million slaves know there that they were free. Two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation, can you imagine that? Learning after two and a half years that you're finally free. So we call this Emancipation Day, uh, and it's uh, the African American Independence Day, if you will, where about four million people, you know, most of the slaves were in the South, heard for the first time two and a half years after the Emancipation Proclamation was announced by President Lincoln that they were free. So ever since then, folks, we have depended upon federal legislation and congressional acts to continue to give us our freedom little by little, from being slaves to being citizens to having other rights and freedoms through the Civil Rights Act and then the Fair Housing Act and other laws. And so we are celebrating freedom and we're acknowledging the freedom that we enjoy today in this incredible country. It is also Pride Month. And uh, I would say prior to 2012, there was nothing, no legislation at all that acknowledged gender identity or sexual orientation. And so June is a month to celebrate the freedom we have to live the life we wanna live, to love the person we want to love, uh, to enjoy the American dream of homeownership without discrimination because of your gender identity or sexual orientation. So it's a lot happening in the month of June and uh, we are celebrating it here at The Powers Now by talking about home ownership. With us today is Dr. Ida Lewis. And uh, I'm so happy she's with us today. I have known Dr. Lewis, Ida, for a while and I uh, helped her to acquire her first property, which so happens to be a four-unit building. So folks, you're going to enjoy this interview, I promise you. So let me share a little bit about Ida. Dr. Ida Lewis is a passionate and innovative community pharmacist that incorporates proactive and integrative therapy solutions focusing on preventative health measures through community health screenings and immunizations as well as addressing patients' immediate needs through consultations, recommendations, and supportive measures of community-based services as requested. Ida contributes her introduction into pharmacy to her great aunt Gretchen Claiborne of Shreveport, Louisiana, during her attendance at Grambling State University. And it was at that moment her aunt frankly discussed what does she want to do with her life, and in turn, Ida's interest in chemistry and math led her to her educational path of, of science. And she got a degree, an associate degree of science with Merritt College in Oakland. Ida received her bachelor's of science in biology from California State 
University of Hayward in 2002. While attending uh, Hayward University, she helped to implement the campus dental health services program. She also participated in pre-professional health programs and completed one year of uh, microbiology research post-grad. In 2007, Ida graduated with her doctorate in pharmacy from the Thomas J. Long School of Pharmacy and Health Sciences at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California at the age of 35. Proud to have completed her journey, albeit her great aunt did not witness this grand accomplishment. So Ida is working on a scholarship for students that are of African-American descent, are single parents, in honor of her great aunt support. Ida has worked in uh, community pharmacy and has been a way of giving her service to a population that has been underserved in healthcare. Ida currently participates in health fairs, providing health screening, immunizations, information referrals, so that everyone has the ability to be in as much control of their health as possible. Ida is a keynote speaker on many topics, including health management, medi medication basics, conversations with your doctors, and why you should speak to your pharmacist when you get your medication. Ida's uh, adopted model is your health is an investment, not an expense. I like that. She encourages everyone to empower themselves, not only through improved health, but also through spiritual, financial, and mental development and elevation Welcome, Ida, to the Power Is Now Homeownership Series. Thank you, Eric. Ida, it's such a pleasure to talk with you and uh, to even know you. Um, I appreciate you know, the fact that you have entrusted me to assist you in acquiring uh, your investment property. Uh, and we are working on other things as we speak. And so I'm excited uh, about sharing your story uh, to the world uh, and about, you know, your, your um, we'll say your view on home ownership, uh, both the challenges and the opportunities. So let's get started. We have a, a tradition on the show where we ask every guest, what does the phrase, the power is now, mean to you in the context of being a homeowner, being a businesswoman, Black business professional, being a woman, what does the phrase mean to you? This was such a great question for me, um, very self-reflective. And when I thought about specifically what it was, it's about having the ability to act, right? So the power, you have the ability, you have the capability to accomplish something. And so my ability is to utilize all my resources, my own personal resources, what I already know um, in terms of this home ownership, my own personal finances, any knowledge and wisdom that I've gained throughout this experience and the whole process um, and what I'm willing to learn because it's a continuous learning of everything to succeed or to get to the goal that you want to accomplish. And then also it's about utilizing the other resources, industry professionals like yourself. <laughs> that is for number one, um, my own family and their personal experiences of what um, they went through in their own purchasing of property, et cetera. Um, and then of course the internet, the internet has a vast amount of information out there. So that's the power. Okay. The power is utilizing the combination of everything. And then in terms of now it's about timing, right? Is it the right time in my life based on my own personal goals? So we can gain all the knowledge and get all the information that we need. And with that, we'll decide when is the right time to make a move. So that is what the power is now. That statement means for me, it's about action and it's about timing. I, I love that. It really is about timing. But sometimes people in getting all that knowledge and information, they, they, they 
find themselves kind of stuck. I call it paralysis analysis, right? And they've acquired all the knowledge and the information and now they're just unsure and not sure about the time. Isn't the time always now? Is there really ever a future when you can do something right now? Tomorrow never comes. I agree. We, we do need to take advantage of what we have in front of us. Um, we do know that time is ticking. That is the one thing that we cannot gain back. And so as long as we are able to take advantage of what we have in front of us, again, whether it is the small steps, acquiring knowledge, look at where you are with your abilities and your capabilities, again, what you have in front of you, make a move towards the direction that you want to go in. That, that's what we need to do. Thank you, Ida, for that great power is now statement. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, just learning more from you uh, about uh, homeownership and your experience and becoming a homeowner. But as you know, uh, before we buy a house, we have to get a job. We have to establish a career. And you are Dr. Ida Lewis. And uh, so please forgive me, doctor, Dr. Lewis. Is it okay to call you Ida? <laughs> Absolutely. So Ida, how did you get into uh, your career? Uh, and what, uh, you know, what was the catalyst to, you know, being involved in, in helping people in uh, your career of uh, really pharmacy? Thank you. Um, it's always, it's actually within my spirit. That's my personality to be very nurturing. And so, of course, you know, when we're younger, we dream of what we want to do with our life. And mine was always healthcare. I just didn't know what aspect of it. I thought about med school. I thought about nursing. I have a lot of nurses in our family. And when I was away at college, I had an aunt who just pulled me to the side to say, hey, what is it that you want to do? Look at what you want to do. And she planted the seed for me for pharmacy. It was natural for me because of the science and because of the math. Uh, when I went to undergrad, I enjoyed my undergrad. I got a bachelor's uh, in biology from Cal State Hayward. And so I had a professor there uh, who was uh, very adamant about me pursuing pharmacy. If I didn't go into pharmacy, she wanted me to be a microbiologist. So that would have been my secondary, my backup plan. But outside of that, I knew that it had to be in a forefront position of helping people um, where folks can trust me, um, that I could use my expertise and knowledge just to make sure that everyone has a better outcome with the use of pharmaceuticals. And so that's how I got to where I am now. And it's been a great career. I love who I am as a pharmacist and that people come and they trust me. They trust what I'm saying. Um, they ask for me specifically, uh, again, because they believe that with the information that I have for them, I'm looking out for their best interests. You know, what I like about pharmacists and, you know, I've never had the pleasure of you uh, explaining some a drug that my doctor has prescribed. <laughs> I know you do a, a wonderful job because you are just so kind and nurturing and you probably get a lot of compliments, right? What's the highest compliment you get from your clients and working with them as a pharmacist? Everyone, you know what? The fact that they come in and they'll say, you know what? The information you gave me really helped me and I appreciate that. I think that is one of the highest things that anyone can say out of their day, out of their way, they came directly into the pharmacy, looked for me and said that. And I appreciate that. Um, many times I feel like this is my God-given talent because there is something that works inside of me when I'm delivering information. And when I see patients receive it, and they hear it and then they actually do it, I feel that I've touched them. There, there is a gift to this. It's a calling, I would like to say. It's not just a paycheck. 
And I don't take it lightly, I take it very serious. And so um, that, that's very important for me. So anytime that anyone acknowledges that I'm there for them, which I am, uh, that's, that, that goes to my heart. Now you are Dr. Uh, Ida Lewis. So where did you go to a school to receive your doctorate in pharmac pharmacology? And, um, and because of everything you're saying right now, I know there's somebody uh, watching and saying, you know what, I need to go where she is and get my prescriptions filled. So uh, first, tell us about the schooling where you went and got that and, and then where you're at. So in terms of my education, I've been in school for a long time. <laughs> And, um, you know, the road wasn't easy, but the fact is that I was consistent and I had the support of family to get through. So I started way back at Merritt College. Actually, I went to a lot of junior colleges as I was trying to figure it out. And I did receive my Associate of Science from Merritt College. Then I attended Cal State Hayward and I received my Bachelor of Science from there. Um, after the degree, after the degree, I did a year of research and applied to pharmacy school. I applied to several different pharmacy schools. The first year, I will tell you, I did not get accepted, but I did continue to pursue the goal. And the second year, I was accepted to University of the Pacific in Stockton. It's the, it's actually Thomas J. Long School of Pharmacy. And uh, so grateful to have been a part of that program and the people and connections that I made along the way. And so I did receive my doctorate of pharmacy. And after a long six months after graduation, I took the greatest two exams that were very difficult and passed them and became a registered pharmacist of California. So I hold a doctorate and my certification, which is registered pharmacist. And you currently are working with the CVS. I am, yes. So where can people find you? <laughs> I don't wanna tell them that. <laughs> I work for CVS in Oakland. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. Awesome. Uh, and a great story. Education is important to you. Obviously, yes. uh, the years of education and then taking those exams. I, I, I can only imagine how challenging that must have been for you. And then all the while, right, you're raising a son. You're a single mother at this time? Yes. How challenging must that have been? And were you renting while you're doing all this? I was renting, uh, I've been renting. So I'm considered a late bloomer. And so, meaning that I started my family and you know went to school all that time. So yes, I was renting and raising a child and it helps to have a village. I think that's one of the main reasons why I was able to succeed so much. My family knew that I was still pursuing my academic goals. And so, um, and so after renting and after going to school, this is where I am. So now my son is a, a young man and um, on to the next stage. So you are an empty nester and um... You have recently purchased a home. How, how long did you rent, Ida, before you bought? I would say forever, but it's been such a long time. 2016 is the year that I purchased my first property. And so up until then, up until 2016. So it's not that long ago. And that makes me in my late forties when I purchased my own property. Wow. So making that purchase was a big deal, uh, but I know that uh, it did not happen overnight. You have spent thousands of dollars in rent, and I know it must have been special to be able to do it on your own. You did it on your own. How important was that to you? That was very important because, again, that was a symbolism of my level of independence. 
uh, from my family and just an accomplishment within myself, just the next step in life of being able to do this. Tell me about your family. Um, so uh, how supportive have they been in your journey to home ownership? Uh, and, you know, you mentioned earlier, you know, there was a kind of a village thing going on helping you with the, the children or with your child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my family have been very supportive, uh, especially the parents, you know, they don't want to continue to, to financially support you. So that, you know, everyone was very happy. Um, you know, when you have family that want to see your success, that's the support. That's the, that is what you need to propel you. It's a personal responsibility I have for myself and for my child. And, you know, not to not to depend on them as much um but i will say in terms of this village and their support because they're also homeowners as well i'm i can go to them for advice and so you know my dad is old school he's owned you know lots of property and my sister-in-law she actually owns um a couple of rental properties as well so I've also been able to speak with her, you know, about certain situations that come up, you know, for myself um, that I need help with, or even uh, giving me recommendations, say on handyman, or, you know, because these are things that need to uh, be done to maintain a building. You have to have, you know, a property manager. Most people have, well, not most, but for those who have property management or they do it themselves, but definitely maintenance around the building, you know, et cetera, constantly needs to be done. And so she's given me the greatest advice on how to look out for things, how to deal with the tenants. Um, and then I do have property management. So that definitely helps as well. So Ida, um, we're going to get into even more detail about uh, owning a home mm -hmm. versus uh, owning a four unit building, uh, which is a big deal. You are the owner of a million dollar four unit building as a first time home buyer. And folks, don't worry, we're going to get into the details. But I want to know, though, uh, this commitment to education, raising your, your son, paying rent, what was the catalyst? that said in 2016, I am done. I just, I am not going to pay another dollar in rent. I mean, you're a pharmacist, you're making good income. Why were you renting so long in the first place and what was the catalyst? To be honest, in terms of dealing with finances, that was a barrier for me in two ways. One, I was in a honeymoon stage because I was making so much money. And so because I had practiced this delayed gratification for so long, part of that honeymoon stage, you know, you take trips, you want to enjoy your money along the way. But I also know that I have to sustain things for the long term. And property is a way to do that. And so the advantage for me and really wanting to uh, be a homeowner was the fact that I would have a tax break. I would have a tax savings. You know, Uncle Sam still takes a lot from federal taxes, but at the end of the day, the write-offs that I have for the building helps. I get a refund, even though I'm not claiming my son anymore. So, so there's a lot of financial advantages to tax breaks, definitely for owning the home. And then I wanted the stability. You know, when you rent, you are at the whims of the owner, right? As a tenant, you have to do according to them. So when you become your, when you become your own landlord and owner, you set the terms of how you want to live, right? You sort of set a precedence for how tenants are going to live. And so there's stability in that, and there's a lot more control in that. And that's what I needed at that time in my life. And the timing, the timing was right. Well, you talk about the barriers and there are a lot of barriers yeah. in our community uh, for African-Americans. And then it is rare. 
I just see African American women purchase homes on their own. Uh, and actually, the statistics show that uh, single African American women, uh, there's a higher rate of homeownership among them than it is among African American men. And so uh, we, as African American men, have always known that the Black woman has been the backbone to the family, the driver. Uh, of, of all things, uh, making things happen, providing for the family, providing the meals, bringing home the money, doing it all. And uh, I can only imagine how exhausting it must be mm -hmm. to be so great as a woman, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you agree? I agree. <laughs> you said it all. Thank you for the acknowledgement. <laughs> So what are the barriers uh, in our community that you know about uh, having, you know, uh, been in the, in the hood, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. and um, knowing uh, a lot of people and, uh, and, and just being a witness to the challenges that we face as a community? What are some of the barriers you see? I think one of them is job stability right now. That's uh, that's a big problem, especially now that COVID has kind of hit. A lot of folks have been laid off um, and have lost their jobs. And so it's about survival. And so, uh, so the lack of jobs, I think also the knowledge of their own personal finances or even the attitudes that they've grown up mm -hmm. with the idea of what is money and how you use it and you know are you a saver or are you a spender um i think a lot of people can be influenced by social media and so social media will display the high rollers you know folks spending a lot of money living the high life getting the extravagant cars and wanting all of the material things right and so you know, who doesn't want to have that and enjoy that, but it's how do you get there? Okay, so we don't, a lot of folks don't understand how you go from A to C, what B looks like. And so I think those are a couple of barriers. I think. Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, those are great barriers and you're absolutely right. Uh, job stability, making enough money, uh -huh. being uh, consumers and influenced by social media, and so not being able to delay gratification until they actually get a good job uh -huh. and have the money to afford those things. And, and this really leads to the barrier that you spoke about uh, in the beginning uh, when we talk about some of the barriers that you had to overcome yourself. So you had a uh, delayed gratification, completed your education, got a great job making good money, and then you uh, started spending that money uh, and, uh, and also recognizing how much Uncle Sam has taken from you as well. So in addition to bringing the spending under control and just ultimately making the decision about buying, what are some of the other things that you had to do after the honeymoon was over and you, you got used to making the income you make uh, that you settled down and just started to make some changes? What were some of those things? That's it. I had to buckle down. I had to save. I had to make sure that um, certain things were in line, like my 401k. It's all about my own personal finances. My 401k any type of insurance, health insurance, uh, life insurance, things like that. I have to make sure that those things are straight, okay, before I could continue to enjoy just spending. It's the business part of living, you know, that you've got to take care of. And so once those got in line, and in fact, I, I, I think I had mentioned to you that I was in touch with my, um, with Jackie, who does the Living Trust. And so that's the next stage for me. That's one of the goals this year because I'm turning 50 and blessed to be turning 50, but I also know that there's certain things that I have to have in place um, for myself, for my son, 
um, or any family members I want to include. And so it's handling the business part and then I can still enjoy everything else. Well, you're certainly handling your business and obviously I have uh, some information on your total financial picture being your mortgage advisor. Yeah. And I can tell you folks that um, Ida is handling her business. She's saving money. She's building wealth through uh, real estate and she's uh, maximizing her income and managing the property well and working with property managers. Ida, uh, I know that you have big goals and one of your goals is to acquire another property uh, in the very near future. Uh, what are some, in your opinion, what are some of the, the best money moves that you've made uh, both prior to and now after owning a home? What are some of the money moves that you've made that you feel would, would recommend to others? The biggest thing right now in terms of with the building is I took advantage of the refinancing um, at your recommendation. And so that's definitely helped transition from the higher interest rate to the lower interest rate and more savings. So that's number one. And then number two, again, it's more of that delayed gratification because I, I told you, Eric, that I'm, I want my convertible. That's a it's my gift to myself, my push gift from 25 years ago. And so I'm still kind of holding off on that at your recommendation. No pressure, no guilt. <laughs> um, but basically just to make sure that I have every, all my ducks in a row and I set myself up for a greater future that I'm gonna get the car one day regardless. But uh, for right now, it's the money moves, you know, again, that you've recommended that I'm making, this is a guide for me. Uh, because honestly, again, even though I talked about, you know, my village and how they are supportive of me with home ownership, we never really had those frank discussions, right? You know, I know that my dad, um, he purchased a lot of properties. He's had, you know, a couple of different homes acquired from family, et cetera. But we never sat down and discussed numbers and what that looked like. I just kind of observed. Okay. So to have this, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, and you leading me and mentoring me. Um, so I have a, a greater idea and I can expand my mind and my view and goals of what I would like for myself and for my life. So really it's about money. It's about money management. That's such a tangible item these days. It really is about uh, money management, uh, but it's also about being open, mm -hmm. uh, being willing to listen to others and to, and to learn, being willing to be mentored. And you are a A-plus student. You must have got straight A's all through school because I, I just appreciate the fact that you're so humble even though you're so smart, you're, you know, because a lot of people, especially doctors and, and attorneys and CPAs, they think they know more than the mortgage advisors. And uh, in fact, they think they know more than most people because of their high degree of education. Uh, and clearly this is a specialty and learning how to manage money. Well, there are extremely wealthy people who make a lot of money and they blow it every year. Uh, the newspapers are filled with multimillionaires going bankrupt. I mean, it's not how much money you make. It's how money you're able to save mm -hmm. and how much money you're able to manage. And you've done an extraordinary job. And it's an honor for me uh, you. to be your partner and, and your goals to continuing to build wealth. And yes, don't buy that car just yet. Your day is coming, though. Your day is coming. <laughs> Well, you know, you know only what you know, what you don't know, you don't know. And so when you elicit other folks who are specializing in that industry, right? So, you know, for people who come into the pharmacy, they don't know about the drugs. You got to talk to me. I know what I know. I know how to get additional information. I know how to utilize my resources. So you get what you need. And I want to make sure you get what you need, right? So 
you know, you're very adamant about certain things. And so the same thing with you, I, this is your lane. This is your specialty, Eric. And I appreciate the information that you've provided over the years, right? And so what I owe myself is to be able to listen and to hear and get the information from you. And then I can in turn decide if it's what I need, if I need to get, you know, many times I've had to call you like, can you break that down one more time? And you, you know, you've taken out special time for me and you're like, okay, this is what it is, A, B, C, and D, because I needed it delivered that way just to get a greater understanding. And so it's, you know, you're a great resource in assisting with the information that I need to make my life work for me, right? So at the end of the day, I know that you have my best interest. And I'll remind you, <laughs> you gotta have my best interest and you do, and I appreciate that. And so again, at the end of the day, it is to propel me forward to see a greater success as something different than what it was before. And so, you know, we're only moving in a forward direction. And again, I appreciate you for your knowledge and your expertise. Thank you, Ida. Uh, everybody needs a coach. Nobody knows everything. Yeah. I mean, who does, right? I, I know just a few things. I know how to write some pretty good poetry. You've heard it. <laughs> and I know, I, know, I know a little bit about real estate and I know about mortgage and uh, that's about it. That's about the extent of my expertise. Uh, and uh, you know pharmacy and you're great at it and your clients love you for the attention you give them. Now, let's talk about the actual acquisition. Okay. You made that move. And uh, I want you to tell us after the break what you did to celebrate it when they gave you the keys. But you made that move, you own a home. And based on your experience now, four years in the game, almost five now, in the game, owning a four unit building, what are, in your opinion, the top five reasons why anyone should be doing whatever they gotta do to buy a home right now? I think the, the biggest, well, for me, it's the tax breaks, okay? That, that was, uh, you know, for me, it's number one, but that should be in the top. You do have great tax breaks when you own a home. Uh, the second one is legacy, legacy wealth. So this is something that will be passed on to my son, okay? So... Um, just so that he has an additional foundation, right? Um, stability, right? And security. So I've planted roots in an area here in the Bay Area. And so, you know, the neighborhood, um, neighbors, you know, I love that feel. Okay. So that's another reason for home ownership. You're not having to move around. You're really forced to save. Again, it makes you take a look at your financial person. We all wear different hats. And so again, this is the business part of living, looking at your finances and, and understand the attitude you have about money. Um, and then at the end of the day, as I get older, this property will be an advantage for me because you know, sometimes when you get older and you gotta take care of your health, I have the ability to sell it. And, you know, as I'm sitting on my rocking chair somewhere, the money that I've, that I've gotten from this property is gonna help take care of me. So, so those are the things that I feel are, they're at least my top five. And I'm sure some people can definitely, um, it resonates with some folks as to a reason for home ownership. You know, uh, my favorite part of your top five uh, is the fact that you can leave it to your son. Mm -hmm. um, and my second part, uh, which I, God forbid, you don't ever need to do this, but it does represent a level of, uh, of uh, money. You know, you could sell this property and, you know, much later in life, years from now, when there is the possibility that you could uh, have some challenges medically or otherwise. I mean, you're in the business, so right. you know that's you know probably 
more real than most people think, right? That we can get, uh, we can become ill, we can become, we can need additional assistance. And those things have to be paid for and to have the asset like you have to that you could either liquidate or perhaps because it is an income property, uh, years from now, the income of that property might be so substantial that you're able to live completely on it and provide additional needs you want. And so those are, those are great uh, uh, benefits. Uh, but let me ask you, do you plan to sell? Your plan is never to sell, right? Only if you have to sell to meet a particular need. But your goal is to truly hold on to this property and build wealth and leave a legacy for your son. Am I right? You're right. I would, I would love to hold on to this, but I know there has to be some level of flexibility right? Because we never know what situations bring to us. We don't know what the future holds. And so, um, but you know, with this being my first property, I love it. I love, I love, I, you know, I got a really good deal. I got a solid building, um, decent tenants. And so I could see holding on to this for a very long time. Uh, so that is my intent to hold on as long as I can. For those of you just joining us, we're talking to Dr. Ida Lewis, first time home buyer and investor. And it all happened at the same time. Folks, she bought a four unit building in Oakland, the Bay Area. And man, oh man, you will not believe how she did it and uh, what the numbers are. We're going to share it all when we come back right after this commercial break. You're listening to The Power Is Now, Homeownership Series. We'll be right back. There is nothing more exciting than the purchase of your new home. The Home Buyer Seminar is here to help you achieve the American dream of home ownership right now. We talk about access to lenders and nonprofits who are willing to give you the down payment for your home when others are not. That is right. The down payment assistance is not a loan. It is a gift. Find us at thepowersnow.com and let us talk about how you will own your home today and live the American dream. The future is now. Watch us live on Facebook every Tuesday or in replay on the Power Is Now YouTube channel. And we're back. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the Power Is Now Homeownership Series. We're talking to Dr. Ida Lewis, who is a first-time home buyer and an investor. How did she become a first-time home buyer? And an investor, she bought a four unit property in Oakland, California, one of the highest cost places to live, well, probably second only to maybe San Francisco and San Mateo and all those high cost areas down there. But she owns a four unit building, folks, a first time home buyer, Ida Lewis. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk with us about homeownership and your homeownership journey. Thank you, Eric. Ida, I want to hear the details here. So first of all, um, why a four unit versus a single family home? Good question. So for me, the four unit made a lot more sense than a single family home, simply because it was investment income as a single woman. Um, I wanted the advantage of having money made for me. And so in my education and understanding, that was the way to go, getting a four unit investment property. So much, much better right now at that, well, at that time, uh, much better than just a single family home. Now, when we first met and issued your pre-approval, um, did we ever issue a pre-approval for a single family home? Or was this an evolution of going from single family to four unit? I think initially I was thinking of a single family home and you encouraged me to consider the investment property to go that route um, and definitely with the four, uh, the fourplex route of um, investing. So that's how, again, your professionalism, your expertise, you directing. I would have never thought about it probably because I was so hooked on, I've got to get my own home. 
um, you know, but this is how we started. And so uh, I'm, I'm actually satisfied. I'm, I'm pretty happy that we went this route. Now, in trying to buy a four unit property, uh, it is not easy, right? And not only does it, you know, take some negotiations and, and a lot of looking, uh, but you also have to have an agent that really knows uh, four unit properties. And you just so happen to be working with a top agent out there in Northern California, Kenny Sessions, who assisted you in identifying the property and also negotiating uh, the property uh, on your behalf. Uh, how challenging was that whole experience? Uh, because a lot of people just don't have the patience they want it now. Many buyers out there are giving up because there's not as much inventory uh, today as it was then. How challenging was it for you? At that time, again, it was very challenging because I didn't know the ins and outs. And that's why you work with people who specialize within, you know, with, within this. And so Kenny specialized. This is his, this is his game. And so um, it was important that I trusted him. And in fact, when you do that and you ask the questions, as long as you're able to get the answers where you're satisfied and understanding, you can trust what they're telling you, that they know the information that they're providing you. So it was with his expertise and his knowledge of looking for the buildings. He knew my personality, where I would want to live, the area that was developing those strategies. And, you know, we found this place and got right in. You sure did. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenny did a great job in negotiating yeah. uh, a great deal for you. Not only were you able to acquire the property at a reasonable price, uh, but you were also able to get a little help from the seller. And, you know, sellers are not helping anybody right now. Sellers are getting paid more than what they're even asking yeah. for. And you were able to get a seller credit. And so tell our audience about the details here. So it's a four unit property. What was the sales price? The sale price was $759,000. Wow, $759,000 for a four unit building. Now, Ida, I mean, that's still a lot of money, right? I mean, uh, when you first started this process, did you have, you know, seven to 800,000 in mind? <laughs> I did it. I didn't have anything in mind. <laughs> you know, you just, you just know that you want property and right. what does that look like. And so again, once you've gone through the process of understanding financially where you are, um, where you're stable, what you can afford through the pre-approval process, and you get that solidified, then you can look for property within that range. So you purchased this property using FHA and uh, that afforded you the opportunity to only put three and a half percent down plus the closing costs. Now, uh, folks, for those of you watching, if you're using conventional financing and you want as a first time home buyer or even as an investor, you want to buy a four unit building, the normal down payment is 25%. And so by using government financing as a first time home buyer, you're able to buy a four unit property at only three and a half percent down. The closing costs will typically run about 3% as well. And so in Ida's case, man, did she make out. Ida, how much was your down payment plus closing costs? What was the total investment you had to make? So Eric, the down payment um, was basically 27,000 and Kenny got me a credit. He, he worked the numbers. He worked it very well. He worked the deal very good. I only had to come up with another $10,000. So my total basic closing cost was 38,000 just to come up with the down payment for 38,000. So down payment, closing costs, everything, $38,000. And, and where did you get the money? Did you save the money or were you given a gift? How did you get the money? Savings. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. You know, when I started my job, um, I entered the job and I had a bonus. And so I held on to that. You know, I'm a, I'm a saver. 
And so I held on to that. And so again, just through my own personal savings, um, I was able to come down with the complete down payment on my own. Now, what were you paying in rent before you made this acquisition? Part of the blessing of renting from family at the time, I again, I had rented for so long and I had moved in uh, with my family for about four or five years. And so I was splitting the rent with my sister. So I was only paying $700 in rent. And so of course the other amount was going towards savings. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. You went from $700 a month in rent to buying a, a almost an $800,000 four unit apartment building. What was your mortgage payment? When I first acquired the building back in 2016, the mortgage payment was $5,100. $5,100 a month. Now, I, you have to tell me, when you went in to sign those loan documents, and here you are, you know, you probably had just made a payment for rent, right? And now you're about to obligate yourself to a $5,100 mortgage. How did you feel? I mean, were you scared? I was scared and nervous because this is the first time I'm now being responsible for a very large payment on a very large investment. I'm just at the beginning. But the important thing in knowing how the FHA program was set up and with my income and the current rents, because I was going to be occupying one of the units, obviously the rents from the other units would cover the mortgage. So I didn't have to come out any extra for the unit that I would occupy. And isn't that one of the requirements of the owner-occupied FHA that the rents have to pay for the look, mortgage, right? Look at you now. Look yeah. at you now, mortgage banker. You're absolutely right. You know, the, the mortgage payment cannot exceed the rents. Cannot. It's, it's called a debt service coverage ratio or sufficiency coverage ratio. And the property has to qualify. In order for the property to qualify, the total income, and they take in consideration the income from all four units, even though you're going, to, you're going to occupy one of them. So they'll look at the projected rents if the property is vacant, which I know that one unit was delivered to you vacant. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that income after the vacancy factor of 75% or 25%, because the bank will uh, give you credit for the rents, but they're not going to give you credit for the property being rented 12 months out of the year. They're, they're making the assumption that you're going to have some vacancies. It's called a vacancy factor. 25% uh, of the time, this uh, building is going to be vacant. Now, you know now, after four years of owning it, that simply hasn't been the case. And so they take that income, 25% uh, of that total income from the property, and then that result has to uh, equal the mortgage payment or be greater than the mortgage payment in order for the property to qualify. And that's how, uh, Ida, you are able to, uh, to qualify for this building. You had the income, you had the credit, uh, that wasn't the problem, and you had the money for the down payment. But if that building itself did not meet the sufficiency coverage ratio, you would not have been able to buy it. And so you're right. Uh, when you went to sign those closing statements, I can imagine how you must have felt. But uh, it was a consolation prize, wasn't it? To know that uh, you had additional income coming in from almost immediately from buying this property. How much income was that? Well, the total amount of the rents um, at that time was $5,800. Wow. So you have $5,800 from three other units and your house payment was $5,100. Mm -hmm. That left you a cash flow of $700. Mm -hmm. And ironically, that equals how much you were paying in rent. Yeah. So you went from paying rent of $700 to getting cash flow of $700 a month. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. How did you feel when you 
got the keys and you walked into the unit you're going to occupy and you're realizing for the first time here that not only you're not paying rent anymore but you're getting paid rent more than enough to even cover the mortgage and put 700 in your pocket how did you feel satisfied and just excited again you know this is the personal journey into being financially independent and responsible. And so this is just another aspect of doing it. And so when you're able to see cash flow and what that looks like, then I knew and I was secure in knowing that this was the right direction that I was going in. I'm glad I made the decision. I'm glad you helped me. So how did you celebrate what did you do? Pop a, a bottle of champagne that Moscato. you Moscato. <laughs> Moscato. That you that you uh, fall on the floor and do we angel wings. I mean, what what else did you do to celebrate this incredible milestone in your life? Actually, I decorated my owner occupied unit nicely. <laughs> so I, you know, I'm. I, I celebrate, I'm not big on celebrations, but, you know, again, just the personal satisfaction, um, you know, having family come over and letting them see, you know, again, what it is that I'm doing and showing that as an example to my son and to my niece and to other family, um, you know, and that's all it is, just being an example and, and showing them what is possible. And then, you know, even this is still a celebration when you invite me to come and, and speak to other people, I'm letting them know that, you know, something that you may not have thought of, I didn't think of a four unit, right? I was, you know, on a home, um, that it is possible. And so this is my way of, you know, when I share the details and my experience, you know, it's just reaching out to let everyone know that it is possible. You're absolutely okay. right. It is possible. Yeah. And not only is it possible to accomplish, but look at you, single African-American woman owning a 759,000, that's in 2016, folks, mm -hmm. building. Now, uh, do you know any other apartment owners, uh, building owners in your area? And do the tenants know that you are the owner? And are they surprised that you own it as a Black female single? Uh, the tenants are very much <laughs> aware that I am the owner. <laughs> and I've gotten, I've gotten able to, uh, uh, to meet, you know, my other neighbors. You know, sometimes people are to themselves, but you know, I know the neighbors on the side of me and, you know, I kind of help watch the neighborhood per se. Um, so folks can identify me in the neighborhood. Maybe they know the details or not, um, but definitely I've had to speak to the owners on both sides of me. Um, and so they're aware of who I am. And so, you know, we just look at it as neighborly. <laughs> well, that's great. But my tenants, my tenants clearly know who I am. <laughs> So Ida, that was in 2016. Mm -hmm. This is 2021, yeah. June, Home Ownership Month, Juneteenth, right? Yep. So where are we today with the property? How much is your mortgage payment today? Because I know you have recently refinanced yeah. and you have to have the property appraised. And over the last four years, you've been managing that property and raising the rent. So where are we today? Okay, well, this is my little happy days. So we know that the property has appraised for 1.3 million. Thank you, God. And so with the refinance, my current um, mortgage payment is uh, $4,693. With the current rents, of course, with COVID, I haven't been able to raise the rents, but we know that is coming soon. Um, but the current rents now, I'm getting $6,850 a month. So cash flow, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> cash flow, Eric, it's about $2,100, $2,157 per month. Now, let me break this down for everybody here, folks. Have you, are you hearing what I just heard? 
her property Ooh. in just four years. Yep. Maybe five? Are we at five? No, not quite. It'll be five years at the end of this year in November, right? Yep. So four and a half years has gone from 759000 to $1,311,000. That is $500,000 in equity. Yep. That's the numbers. Wow. And then you go from a $700 a month cash flow and in four and a half years, you have a cash flow of $2,100 a month. Yes. Yep. Wow. All I could do was shake my head. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> from a financial perspective, from, you know, th this essentially is a business. This is, you know, has been profitable for me. I'm, I'm grateful and I'm blessed, you know that these are the numbers that are coming up. And, and of course, we can look at the straight numbers of 2,100 a month. We know there's maintenance. We know there's other things, but, you know, just the, just straight off the top, this, you know, it's a blessing. I do feel blessed. And yeah, with $2,100 a month in cash flow, uh, you're able to have proper professional property management, you're able to take care of the property and handle any maintenance related issues yes. and still net a nice sum of money every month. So Ida, when was the last time that you have ever paid for housing for yourself? I mean, from renting, I mean, we're, are we talking four years? You haven't had four and a half years. You haven't had to pay rent or even a mortgage. I have not had to pay rent out of my pocket since I, I purchased this property in 2016. So what does that mean to you in terms of being able to save money? Because, you know, right now, California is in a housing crisis and uh, the 6 million renters that are out there right now, according to a recent report, 3 million of them pay almost 50% of their income in rent and the other three about 30% of their income in rent and housing expense. How is owning a four unit building enable you to be able to save money? Have you achieved new milestones in terms of savings? I have, and that's, that's just it. I'm, I'm able to save. I'm not paying anything out of my own personal account everything that i have is from the account that i have for the building so any maintenance anything like that is from the profits of the building so really it just it turns it it, it just goes back into the building so i even have you know my own personal laundry that's downstairs for the tenants you know and so i've i've uh, revamped it and so there's a profit even from that, you know, a few hundred dollars a month. So that's added in as well. So, you know, um, that is the advantage again of this property. I'm not paying anything out of my own personal income. Everything is from what the building generates. Ida, congratulations. I, I tell you, I'm just, I'm full right now. I, I, this is what I love about what I do. You know, I'm a mortgage advisor. I help make dreams come true. I provide people the support, the information, the tools, the resources, the knowledge, so they think and build wealth. And when, you know, I see the, the, the work that you've put in in acquiring the property, the great agent and the partnership that we have with him in, in negotiating the deal, and then you being so humble and just willing to follow our advice and recommendations. And here you sit today, four and a half years later, with a net worth that has increased a half a million dollars and cash flow, not from your labor, but in passive income from your building of $2,100 a month. Uh, I am, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm blown away and uh, I, I feel, uh, I feel like I own the building. I feel like it's me. I mean, because uh, I helped you achieve that and I'm so proud of you and what you've been able to accomplish. And now I'm looking forward to the next chapter as you continue 
to build wealth. And I, and I want to talk about that for a moment. Now, uh, your parents are investors. They own homes. Your brothers, your sisters have investment properties. And so you had, you were in that environment where you had some knowledge and the examples, but did they ever sit down with you and talk to you about money and, and, and investing in real estate? Or did you have to kind of do it on your own? Uh, you know, my parents really didn't discuss it. My, my um, dad was basically the, the provider of the family and he's the one um, that spearheaded, uh, you know, the houses and, you know, property and vehicles and things like that. And so I was more of the observer. And so we never really sat down and had clear, distinct you know, conversations of this is what you should do, this is what you need to have, et cetera. Um, and, and that's just, you know, it's just what it is, but I'm really good at observing. And so when it came to asking questions and things like that, you know, my dad was very clear and he answered those questions for me, but no, we never really had any, any distinctual conversations to direct me. I just know that I wanted to do something that he was doing. And so the same with my other siblings, it wasn't a matter of them directing, but as I got into this new stage of my life, I know that I could go back in and talk to them about certain things. So I think, you know, again, if we go back to barriers, you know, it's about having these specific conversations. What I do with my son, Oh, we have open-ended conversations about everything. He's 24, he'll be 25. You know, I say he's off my payroll, which means I'm not financing him for anything right now. Thank God for that. But I also make sure, you know, where are you with your student loans? Where are you with saving money? What do you want to do? So I'm having these direct conversations with him because at this age, at 24, 25, you know, that's a vital age for him to really start thinking um, about his finances and where he wants to go and what he wants to do. He has to be able to envision, um, you know, where he wants to be with his money, so. Well, I'm glad you're doing that because this is how you start building generational wealth. It is first through education, right? And then it's also through assistance. And you are in a position uh, when he has secured uh, stable employment to be able to help him get into a home. And I just know that he also is going to buy a four unit building. I know you must have had a conversation with him about that. Oh, that has to be his first purchase and to follow in his mom's footsteps. Am I right about that? We've had several conversations. One thing I can tell you that I've done and for um, other, other parents of younger children, uh, one thing I helped with his credit was made him an authorized user on my credit card because I pay my card off. So his credit is good. And in fact, I asked him, you know, um, probably about three weeks ago, I said, hey, what is your, what's your credit score looking like? And he's scrolling through Chase and he's like, my credit score is like 720. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, but there's this one thing on there, you know, and it says, you know, Chase, you know, the credit card. I said, give me five and say, thank you, mom. I, you know, I'm the one that helped you get that. So <laughs> that's part of this legacy as well to, to try and get him a head start. There's no reason why we can't help our kids get a head start, right? He's got education behind him. Now, hopefully we're setting up the financial uh, foundation and base for him so that he doesn't have to play catch up. So many of us, we've had to play catch up and we're just a little far behind the game, but I, I wanted him to be in a place where he's positioned to just excel if that's, if that's the direction he's going in, but at, at least coming from a good, strong foundation. Well, I'm so happy to hear that you are in investing, you've invested in his education, you've helped him, he's been on the payroll, he's now through school, he's off the payroll, but you continue to invest your knowledge in him and your oversight on what he is doing. 
You know, one of the greatest things about being an adult is that you get your freedom. You know, nobody can tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, where to go, you know, that independence. But it's also one of the worst things that can happen to you as an adult because you're not used to that freedom yet. And uh, that leads to abuse and all kinds of very bad decisions. And I think sometimes parents let go too early and mm -hmm. uh, supervising and advising uh, their children. And uh, I know this from experience, being the father of four daughters, uh, my wife, uh, <laughs> My wife said she had the Underground Railroad, you know, for the kids, <laughs> because I'm such, I'm so strict, you know, on everything. And uh, because I know firsthand what freedom can do if, um, if your children aren't ready for it. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that does he realize what he may inherit? Uh, based on the rule of 72, whatever rate of appreciation, we should probably calculate and see what it is. Mm. Uh, but your appreciation on this property has been in the 7 to 10% range, maybe even higher. But imagine that based on the rule of 72, if you divide the rate of appreciation into 72, that equals the number of years it would take for your asset to double whether it be cash or real property. Mm -hmm. And so your property is worth $1.3 million today. Yes. If you are averaging 7% appreciation in 10 years, this property will be worth $2.3 million. I like the way that sounds. <laughs> in, in 20 years, it'll be worth $4.6 million. Wow. And in 20 years from now, you definitely will be at least in a position uh, to retire and or maybe even sooner. And imagine having a paid for property. Yeah. And God only knows. So if you're getting right now uh, $6,800 a month in rent and you doubled the rent, just the rent is doubled every 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about that. 12, that goes from, say, just just rounded down to 6,000, 6 to 12 in 10 years, 12 to 24 in 20 years. And so you mentioned earlier in your five reasons that retirement, uh, this truly is one of your, part of your portfolio for retiring. Yeah. So do you have any plans? I know you mentioned earlier, you're going to be talking to Jackie Soto who is going to put together a living trust. What other things are you working on to ensure that um, your wealth is passed on to your son, whether something unforeseen happens now or later in the future? Again, I'm just, you know, I'm making sure that he's aware um, of the plans that I have um, because this is, it's all in my name right now but because he's going to inherit it one day, um, it's making sure that he understands the level of responsibility and what that means. Um, and just, you know, and just continue as I'm doing, making those strategic money moves. We'll see how many other properties that I'm able to um, afford and amass within this collection of my portfolio. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's really all my plans, just you know, for right now. Whatever other ideas you have, Eric, I'll take. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm full of ideas, and uh, I'm excited about the future. I know that we have talked about the next move, and that is to acquire another four-unit building in which you will occupy. When you make that transition to acquiring another four-unit building in which you will occupy. Mm -hmm. that will free up the unit you're in to rent. Now, you're already at $6,800 a month. Yes. How much, let me get my calculator ready here. How much will you be renting your unit out? Because I know you really tricked it out, mm -hmm. right? I did. I'd like to think uh, at least starting about $2,200. It's a, it's a two-bedroom. So it's going to be up there for sure. And, um, you know, because it, it, it has all new appliances, um, it, it's a very nice unit. So 
uh, it's going to be up there. So if you rent that property out for twenty two hundred, right, you are already at a twenty one hundred dollar cash flow mm -hmm. with after paying the mortgage. So your cash flow is going to go to forty three hundred dollars a month. And that doesn't include the cash flow you will have on the second four unit building you'll buy that will probably be similar to what it was when you bought this property, somewhere between five to $700 a month, which means you'll be close to 48 to maybe $5,000 a month in cash flow with no mortgage to pay. Yes, yep, nothing coming out of my direct pocket. Well, now is the time to do it with interest rates so low and you are ready. You've been saving your money. Your credit is outstanding. Your building is appreciation, appreciating. I mean, Ida Lewis, you're doing incredible and fantastic and great things. I'm so thankful for your time today and just sharing your story. And I certainly hope people are either watching or listening and sharing this information because they can do it, right? They can do it. You can do it, folks. You can buy, as a first-time home buyer, a four-unit build. It is not easy. That It is not easy. You're going to have to do some homework. You're, you're going to have to save your money. You've got to have the money for down payment and closing costs. It is not going to be easy, but you can do it. Ida, any final words of encouragement, any final thoughts as we close out this uh, great homeownership series segment? I think the first thing is just being realistic of where you are financially. Again, it's a big emphasis on finances, but that's what we're using to purchase and to maneuver through society. So getting a clear understanding of where you are, don't make an assumption, Go through the experts like Eric and his team to make sure if you need to repair your credit, whatever it is that you need to do, any savings that you have, um, get the advice again from Eric and his team. If you have uh, other families who are selling or who are willing to gift you money, whatever, whatever it takes to build your financial portfolio, that's where you start. Excuse me, that's where you start. Um, and then from there, again, you have professionals around you, you have a lot of resources around you. Ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions to have folks break things down so you can understand it clearly and may have to repeat it as Eric has done for me <laughs> many times, you know, to do that. Um, and so when it, when it comes to finding someone that you can trust, who knows who you are, what it is that you need, based on your lifestyle, your own personal needs, family needs, uh, you, you trust them, okay? And you go along with the flow and understand where you are at all times and, and just make sure that, you know, and just have faith, really have faith that it is possible. So uh, no one is out of the game, but when you have the level of awareness uh, that you need to have to move forward, you can actually accomplish your goals. Ida Lewis, Dr. Ida Lewis. Yes, sir. Here today on the Power Is Now homeownership series, sharing her story and her journey to homeownership. Thank you again, Ida, for your time today. Folks, if you have heard her story and you are inspired by it, let her know. Drop us an email. We'll pass it on to her. If you're watching on Facebook Live or YouTube, please note something in the chat room about this interview, about the information she shared. If you are inspired, let us know. Because that's the goal of this uh, series, is to inspire and educate everyone to achieve the American dream of homeownership. It is still very much alive in spite of the news you hear, homeownership is still very much alive. Well, that's another wrap of The Powers Now. Now, please go to our website, thepowersnow.com, and check out the other shows on their homeownership series. And also, 
listen to us on our podcast, which you can find on iTunes, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, anywhere you get your podcasts. And of course, connect with us socially. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you can get more information about homeownership and how to build wealth through home ownership. Thank you for watching. Remember, we are at our best and we maximize our success when we act now, the power is now.